Good afternoon. I'm Haley Leha with the Galveston Bay Foundation, and I want to welcome you to Concurrent Session 10, Track 2. I have the pleasure of introducing our panelists today, and they will be speaking on the uses of recycled oyster shell in reef restoration. So we'll begin on the Northeast Coast with Billion Oyster Project in New York, where we'll hear from Charlotte Bosch and Danielle Bissett. We'll then move down the East Coast to North Carolina Coastal Federation with Aaron Fleckenstein and then into the Gulf of Mexico with Krista Russell from Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana. You'll also hear from me in Texas with the Galveston Bay Foundation. And last but not least, we'll end on the West Coast in California with Katie Nichols from Orange County Coast Keeper. I wanna thank you all for joining us today and I look forward to hearing from you in the Q&A session. Hi, my name is Charlotte Bosch and I'm the Shell Collection Program Manager at Billion Oyster Project. And hi, I'm Danielle Bissett. I am the Assistant Director of Restoration at the Billion Oyster Project. Billion Oyster Project is a nonprofit with a mission to restore oyster reefs to New York Harbor through public education initiatives. We envision a future where New York Harbor is a world-class public blue space, well cared for by the communities that surround it. One aspect of our restoration work is our shell collection program, which collects oyster shells from New York City restaurants to reuse as part of our rest restoration work. Pre-COVID-19, we collected oyster and clam shell from roughly 75 restaurants in New York City, collecting on average 400,000 pounds of oyster shell a year with a five day a week pickup schedule. Back in March, we paused the shell collection program due to COVID-19 um, but this past August, we restarted on a mod modified two-day-a-week schedule after a five-month pause. Um, our shell collection program, um, our operations uh, are conducted by The Lobster Place, which is a wholesale seafood company located in the Bronx. The Lobster Place employs the truck driver, operates our truck, and manages the overall day-to-day um, -day collection process. My primary role for the Shell Collection Program is managing all of our restaurant relationships and any hiccups that come along with shell storage and collection at each restaurant. I also um, conduct restaurant outreach and onboarding, and I am the Lobster Place's main point of contact within Billion Oyster Project. Another aspect of my work is conducting educational dining events at our Shell Collection restaurant partners called Oyster Socials. Um, here we talk about shell collection and BOP's work over unique oyster preparations designed by uh, the chefs at each restaurant and paired with beverages. Um, one of our lead funders is uh, Talisker Single Malt Scotch Whiskey. Um, they're one of our lead funders of the shell collection program. And events like this one, um, our oyster show socials are ways that we incorporate Talisker into our year round programming. So back to the logistics of shell collection, um, the lobster place will pick up shells from restaurants and transport those shells to a depot in Brooklyn where the shells are dumped into a 30 cubic yard container. About once a month, these containers fill up and the shells are transported to a curing site on Governor's Island. Um, here, the shells are piled no more than three feet high um, and environmental conditions like hot temperature, rain and critters eating the flesh off of the shell um, clean and prepare the shell for reuse. One of the largest hurdles um, being in New York City is finding accessible places to cure our oyster shells. We've partnered with both public and private entities and are always on the, the hunt for additional curing space. We also host volunteer days um, cleaning the shell and preparing the shell uh, for reuse in one of our many oyster reef structures. Once cured, the shells are either placed loose, unseeded at one of our oyster reefs or are seeded with larvae produced at the hatchery um, on Governor's Island out of the Harbor School, which is a public high school, um, or in our new remote setting facility in Brooklyn. This newly set spat on shell um, or young oysters are transferred to BOP restoration projects across New York City that my colleague Danielle will discuss more. Great, thank you. Um, so now I'm going to talk about what we do with the shell when we receive it from our shell collection program. Um, and in addition to the physical conditions that we design our projects around, we also have um, four main installation categories uh, that we also that will also inform our design, which are oyster research stations, community reefs, 
oyster nurseries and large scale oyster restoration projects, which I will get into in the following slides. So, next slide. Um, so our oyster research stations are small off-bottom baskets that are primarily used by students and teachers that are installed on a bulkhead, railing, um, a pier, that are easily accessible because the primary objective is to expose students and teachers to the hands-on learning at the water's edge in New York City. Next slide. The community reefs are on bottom structures that are typically installed in shallow near shore locations where the public can wade into the water to retrieve files and bags to monitor oysters and to learn how to collect data and why it's important. So these two um, sites, the installation techniques, the ORS program and the community reef sites, um, the overall objective of them is to engage the public in our work so they understand firsthand why our work is important and to also expose them to the natural environment that is throughout New York City. The harbor is usually um, a key natural resource that the public should have access to and so through our public engagement programming we advocate for this access constantly. Next slide. And then we have oyster nurseries. Um, and these are off-bottom structures that either float or are attached to piers or floating docks. The primary objective for these types of installations are to increase the number of adults throughout New York Harbor. Two major things that are lacking in New York Harbor to oyster restoration are one, healthy adults that are capable of spawning and two, hard substrate for larvae to set to. So the purpose of oyster nurseries are to act as that source for healthy adults that can add larvae to the waters surrounding New York City. And in parallel to that point, through our large scale restoration projects, that's where we add the hard substrate uh, for larvae to eventually set on, which leads me to my next slide, please. So these large scale restoration projects are on bottom installations that are multi acre projects that include both loose shell and shell contained in some form or another. For example, our standard gabion, which is the top left photo, is a four foot by two foot by two foot structure that we set larvae to, and this structure automatically elevates the spat on shell in the water column and maximizes the vertical space. So basically, we're, we're jump-starting an oyster reef in this case. Also, we're working with e-concrete um, at a few of our sites, which is the bottom left photo and the bottom middle, middle photo. Um, the bottom left is an example of a future project, and the bottom middle is a picture from an existing project site in Staten Island. Um, as you can see, the disks are stackable, which again takes advantage of the vertical space in the water column and gets the oysters off the bottom, where we have that fine sediment that structures typically subside in, which is a major concern of ours while we're uh, restoring oysters in New York Harbor. And as you can see, the oysters are growing really well um, off of the e-concrete disc. They automatically go into that open space and grow into the 3D habitat that we're, we normally see oyster reefs do. Um, and just to note, this is not a comprehensive list of our large scale structures we're using, but it does give you a sense of the design opportunities that we're implementing to restore oysters in New York Harbor. Um, next slide. So that's the end of our talk. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity of speaking on this panel and um, please feel free to reach out to Charlotte or, or myself um, for any additional questions that you may have. Thank you. Thanks. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today and thank you to Haley with the Galveston Bay Foundation for organizing this panel discussion on the uses of recycled oyster shell in restoration projects. My name is Erin Fleckenstein. I'm a coastal scientist and regional manager with the North Carolina Coastal Federation. We are a private nonprofit organization that works to empower people from all walks of life in the active stewardship of our coastal resources. We focus our efforts on improving coastal water quality and critically important habitats such as salt marsh and oyster reefs. We do this through our program areas of environmental advocacy, environmental education, and habitat restoration and preservation. I was asked to talk with you today a little bit more about how we as an organization use oyster shell in our um, habitat restoration projects. 
In North Carolina, similar to other states and areas of the country, oysters are at critically low levels. Um, this is largely attributed to historic overharvest without returning enough substrate to the water, followed subsequently by continued habitat loss, natural disasters, low recruitment, disease and predation, as well as declines in water quality. While we do not have a current stock assessment of our oyster population in North Carolina, the state does declare oysters as a species of concern in need of management. There have been actions taken in the state to restore oyster population um, for over a century. There are three main ways that oyster reefs are built in North Carolina. These are through our living shoreline restoration efforts, um, culture planting and patch reef creation, as well as oyster sanctuaries. Each of these three methods for building back our oyster population have slightly different um, techniques associated with them and also slightly different outcomes or goals associated. Living shorelines are really designed to um, limit shoreline erosion as well as to build back oyster habitat. Culture planted reefs are designed for building and replenishing um, substrate for larvae to settle on and subsequent oyster harvest and oyster sanctuaries are built to serve as brood stock reserves. Living shorelines and culture plantings are where we see the most use of recycled oyster shell in the, in the habitat creation. In order to get material that is needed for reef building activities, the state, nonprofits, and others um, will often buy shell from shucking houses, and we also use marl and crushed concrete to build out the reefs when um, we don't have enough volume of shell in our, um, available to us. In 2003, the state launched a shell recycling program with the idea to collect as much shell as possible from restaurants and from individuals, from um, private oyster roasts, etc., to get that material and make it available to use for restoration practices. The recycling program ran for about a decade, and at its height, the program recycled approximately 300 tons of material annually, which accounted for about 15% of the shell that was needed by the state for their culture planting practices. So this graph here shows you the um, sort of main active years of the recycling program, the total amount of material that was used by the state in their culture planting activities, and then the green portion of each of the bar graphs is showing you the amount of material that came specifically from the shell recycling program. So this program ran for a little over a decade, and by 2018, it had to be ended due to state budget cuts. Um, the state continues to build oyster reefs, but now they focus their energy on strictly buying material from shucking houses and other um, shell providers. So the Federation seeing an opportunity to collect shell for our restoration practices and also to build on the program and the outreach and engagement activities that the state had started through their restoration, um, their, excuse me, shell recycling program. Um, we secured a small foundation grant in order to launch what we call the Restaurant to Reef Oyster Shell Recycling Program. This program is still very much um, in its infancy, but it is um, building off of the state's program and also making a few changes and modifications. We rely on a few strategically placed stockpile locations that have roll-off dumpsters on them. And we use a, a cadre of fantastic dedicated volunteers who visit our uh, oyster um, selling restaurants and collect discarded shell in five gallon buckets and then bring it to those roll-off dumpster and stockpile locations. We didn't want to just collect the shell though, we also wanted to use it in our restoration practices. And so I'm going to talk to you about how we went about citing our restoration um, project that used shell from this restaurant to reef program. We met with a group of um, fishermen, four fishermen, that we had a previous relationship with, and they helped us to think about where we should be prioritizing our efforts for building oyster reefs. Um, they met with us and helped us to identify areas where it might be suitable to build either a living shoreline or a culture planted or patch reef location that would be open to harvest at some point in the future. And in addition to siting the reef, where would these be good locations to build reefs, we also asked them, where are areas that we should be avoiding? Where's potential conflict, either with existing commercial fishing 
um, activities or other recreational uses of the sound that they were aware of that we needed to consider in our, in our siting. The information that they provided to us was compiled in this map. And so now we had a very general idea of where we could explore for restoration, but we needed to hone in on it a bit more. One of the fishermen that um, had provided us with some input offered to spend a day on the water with us, diving into the, one of these sites a little bit more deeply. Um, so we spent the day in Wysocking Bay, which if you look at the map, it's the location on the bottom left of your screen. And that was one of our priority sites for restoration. So we spent the day with Joseph Andrews collecting some information about Wysocking Bay to sort of better um, identify our project. We visited eight spots within Wysocking Bay and captured a suite of information about each of the sites to help inform our ultimate restoration design and, um, and site selection. So some of the things that we were collecting information on when we were in the field included some of the physical siting characteristics of, of the areas that we visited, including bottom type. We didn't want to site our reef in an area that was either too muddy or too um, sandy. We wanted it to be sort of a, a healthy mix of the two just right um, for the oyster restoration to be successful. We wanted a water depth of about five to six feet. This was both for the construction access and future access for hand honging. Um, we also were interested in capturing information about how exposed the site was to prevailing winds and wave energy because we, we wanted to be able to deploy our material as just loose oyster shell and so we needed a site that wasn't too exposed. Um, it needed to be somewhat protected. In addition to those physical siting considerations, we also looked at some environmental data about the sites that we visited. Um, we were looking at you know, making sure the salinity range was conducive to oyster growth. We wanted to make sure that there was no um, known issue with dissolved oxygen, either prolonged or sustained drops in DO, maybe attributed to being you know, too close to the mouth of a drainage canal. Um, similarly, we wanted to make sure our site was not in an area that would be prone to sedimentation, again, siting it away from drainage canals. Um, and that the bacteria levels were suitable for oyster growth and, and eventual harvest. We wanted to make sure that the water quality would, would support the oyster harvest eventually. We also wanted to make sure our site was avoiding any conflict with known uses, both the commercial and recreational uses, as well as existing habitats. So making sure that we were avoiding any um, known SAV beds, as well as known oyster reefs. So we collected data in the field, but then we also were able to sort of cross-check our data with um, these maps that had been produced by the Division of Marine Fisheries, where they were mapping you know, both SAV and oyster habitat in the sounds. So lastly, we were looking at making sure that the site we selected would be logistically feasible for construction. Our material was, our main stockpile of location was up in Wanchis, and the site that we were considering was down in Wysocking Bay, and so we wanted to make sure we'd be able to get the material easily from Wanchis down to Wysocking Bay, either over the water or whether we needed to truck material from Wanchis to a closer um, land-based stockpile location and then from the land via barge or boat to the water. And so we, we looked at some different boat ramps that we could potentially use. Ultimately, this these logistical issues were easily overcome, but we did want to make sure we had thought this through as far as how we were going to about, um, go about executing our construction of the reef. Lastly, we wanted to look at some of the other areas around our reef site that um, hadn't been restored in the past and, and how successful they had been. We wanted to use that as a gauge for understanding and having you know, some good expectations about how our restoration might proceed. So after we collected all of this information and we reviewed our options, we, we met with the Division of Marine Fisheries and discussed the possibilities with them and finally um, decided on this location. It's a two acre reef that we sited at the mouth of Lone Tree Creek. So we initiated permits for the work. Um, ultimately though, we were able to work underneath the state's culture planting permit, which helped tremendously as far as a, a timing um, a time saver is concerned. 
The only limitation with us working under the state's permit was that we had to use their equipment and follow their protocols, which was fine, um, but it did mean that we were on their schedule um, as far as deployment was concerned. Not a problem. It all worked out great, but that just that was one of the sort of limiting factors of working underneath the state permit. Um, the shell that we used to build out this reef site was entirely collected through the Restaurant to Reef program. Um, we only had about 1,200 bushels of material available to us because this program is so young and getting off its um, getting off the ground here. But we had 1,200 bushels of material that we had stockpiled and used. Um, we barged it down to the reef site. Um, we were able to go directly from Juan Cheese over water to our reef site which was, a, again, a logistical help for us. Um, and then once down at the reef site, the material was washed off the, the deck of the barge onto our reef location. We had sited a two acre reef, but we only had the 1200 bushels of material available to us. Uh, we wanted to get to a uh, minimum height of six inches off the bottom up to 12 inches, so we concentrated the material into sort of one quarter of that two acres. So about a half acre reef was constructed with this material. And this will allow us to go back in subsequent years with our you know, additional material that we collect to finish building out this reef site. We will continue to monitor the site in the coming years and start planning for future reefs. Of course, we would like to ramp up our efforts and collect more shell from more restaurants. Um, as we move forward and, and doing this in a cost effective manner is something that we are you know, spending a lot of time thinking about because we want this program to be sustainable in the long term. Collecting shell from restaurants and using it to build out oyster reefs is you know, really important to us. So doing it in a way that allows the program to continue is, is going to be important. Um, hope to be able to come back and share with you guys success stories about how the reef is doing in the future years. Um, I want to thank you all for participating with us today and definitely thank my colleagues for their help in making this project a success. A big shout out to the North Carolina Division of Marine Fisheries. They have been tremendous through this whole project and helping us every step along the way. And my colleague, Leslie Vegas, who runs the Restaurant to Reef program and coordinates our restaurants and shell volunteers. Um, couldn't, couldn't do this without her, so I want to make sure she gets credit. And of course, our host sites and child volunteers that are making this possible have, have all done so much work um, in collecting the shell and, and making it available for this project. So thank you all, and I look forward to taking any questions from you during our Q&A session at the end of these panels. Good afternoon, and thank you again for joining us. I'm Krista Russell, the Coastal Scientist for the Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana. I focus on monitoring of the coalition's coastal forest, marsh, dune, and oyster reef restoration projects across Louisiana's coast. Today, I'll be sharing our planning and design process, as well as some lessons learned from our most recent living shoreline project in Barataria Bay. The coalition's oyster shell recycling program began in 2014 with two primary goals. First, to capture oyster shell that would otherwise go to landfills and second, to return those shell resources to Louisiana's coastal waters. Our program operates on a network of partners. We work with 18 New Orleans area restaurants to secure a waste oyster shell. In exchange for about 70 tons a month of shell, we provide them with an alternative endpoint for a major waste product. We help support their sustainability practices. And we provide them with promotional opportunities. To handle this volume of shell, we partner with a local waste contractor, Phoenix Recycling. We also partner with volunteers to prepare the shell for installation and when possible to build the reefs themselves. Our shell bagging and reef deployment events are an opportunity to engage the public in Louisiana's coastal land loss challenges. It encourages stewardship and helps the public make smart consumer choices. The program has engaged over 1400 volunteers to date, many of whom go on to become coastal advocates. So far, our recycled shell has been used to construct three living shoreline projects. The first, completed in 2016 in Biloxi Marsh, is a half mile long breakwater structure made of galvanized steel gabion steel baskets, primarily filled with loose but with some bagged shell. Our second project, the Point of Shen Community Reef, which we completed in 2019, was the first of our community-based projects. 
We partnered with the Point of Shen Indian Tribe to hand build a 400 foot bag shell reef to mitigate erosion of an important cultural resource. We have a fourth reef planned for the spring of 2020 in Plaquemines Parish, following a very similar design, this time in partnership with the Grand Bayou Indian Village. Today, I'm gonna to focus on our third reef and most recent project, our Barataria Bay Living Shoreline. The Barataria Bay Living Shoreline is located in Hackberry Bay. When we're approaching our projects, we look at three primary factors in planning. First is the suitability of a given area for an oyster-based living shoreline solution. That includes basic physical considerations like water depth and the energy of the environment, but also the relative suitability for supporting oyster settlement and growth. We don't have the capacity to seed our projects, so we are relying on natural recruitment. We also look to the future when assessing habitat suitability. We look at how things like sea level rise and large scale restoration projects might impact our site. For this project, we consulted with regional oyster experts online restoration tools, and traditional ecological knowledge literature to help us determine that our location provides suitable habitat for oysters. Through our partners at the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, we know that while the area doesn't seem to follow a traditional seasonal pattern of spat set, they do get strong if irregular sets of spat for, and have for several years. There's also a managed seed reserve nearby that could serve as a larval source. If you look at that image to your left, the blue blob in Hackberry Bay is that seed reserve. The green line is the location of our project. We also ensured that this project was located outside of the potential outfall area of nearby planned restoration activities. Second, we're looking at relative need. A whole lot of Louisiana could use some help. So we're looking for areas where we can have a broader impact at either a community level or an ecosystem level. So this area of marsh is a critical feature that protects that public seed preserve in Hackberry Bay to the north from the heavy predation and damage from boring sponges and invasive oyster drills that are common in the more saline water to the south. In addition to reducing erosion to that marsh barrier, this reef could also eventually serve as a source of oyster larvae for the area. Third, we are addressed our ability to access the site for construction, monitoring, and as an engagement tool. So this area, from you can see from the map to your right, is home to dozens of private oyster leases, which we spent months identifying, contacting, and developing relationships with all of those owners and landowners and leaseholders, and working with them to identify access routes that were the least concerning to them and also efficient for our project. Um, this site is also relatively close to boat launches in Grand Isle, making visits to the reef much more accessible. The Beartea Bay Living Shoreline was designed with four primary goals in mind, and they led our design. First, to maintain the nearby marsh's integrity by reducing shoreline erosion. Second, to create suitable habitat for oyster settlement, growth, and reproduction, and therefore in the long term providing ecosystem services. Third, to incorporate resiliency into the shoreline not just armoring the shoreline, but also planning for the project to continue to provide some ecosystem benefit as it ages. And fourth, to serve as an example of how climate adaptation elements can be successfully incorporated into restoration projects. With these goals in mind, we ultimately decided to use a series of galvanized steel gabion mattresses. Those were filled with a mix of bagged and loose shell, and they were aligned parallel to the shore with regular breaks stretching a total of about 4,000 linear feet. This design allowed us to address each of our goals. For erosion reduction, the mattresses are much more flexible than other support types, and they can be contoured along the shoreline profile, creating, reducing concerns for things like scouring. The mattresses also create a six foot distance for waves to travel over before they reach the shoreline, which gives you more potential to diffuse energy before reaching the edge. As far as oyster habitat is concerned, we know recycled shell is an excellent culch material and it creates a lot of interstitial space. The gabions were installed contoured along the shoreline profile, as I mentioned, which provides six feet over which oysters can settle at an intertidal depth. This provides more upper surface area compared to some other project types for settlement and also a six foot range over which there is a habitat of slightly differing depth. As far as resiliency in the short term, 
this design is improved from previous projects in two ways. First, the gabions include a Galfan coating this time, which provides longer corrosion protection. We learned that lesson pretty hard from our first reef where the gabions have already started to fall apart. The mattresses also have a reduced frontal surface compared to other gabion types, and that's reducing the area that's exposed to head-on wave energy. At our Biloxi Reef, we think the already corroding gabion baskets gave way in part because of that head-on constant wave energy. In the long term, this reef also has the potential to convert to a subtitle habitat. As we see sea level rise over time, a healthy reef system that was intertidal is just going to shift to another habitat type. Our outreach and engagement efforts with volunteers and stakeholders at the management and planning levels are meant to help influence people's perception of what can be done to make restoration projects climate adaptive. We intend for this project to add to the body of work supporting climate adaptation planning and restoration and we're hoping to inspire adoption of similar methods at a broader scale, particularly in the Louisiana Master Plan. We're also incorporating a minimum of a year of monitoring with the hope for much longer. Uh, we're looking at both the reef development and changes to the marsh edge over time. In addition to the challenges you would expect from any living shoreline project, we also had this little global pandemic to handle. It drastically changed the availability of some pretty basic materials. Um, to remain within budget and planning, we decided to source our gabions from overseas. Unfortunately, that means that the manufacturing factory was initially delayed and then closed down. And our gabions, the literal building blocks of our reef, arrived in June instead of in January. We were also forced to pause work due to a loss of labor. Just as one example, um, our engineering firm's employees were furloughed for several months for safety, and we had to wait to stake out final alignment and confirm the access route. If you can't confirm those things, you run into problems with everyone's favorite, permits. Permitting is always a challenge, and it's much, much worse when nothing is working quite the way it's supposed to. The closures and subsequent delays made it really challenging to compile the necessary materials to submit applications, um, extending the deadline to those applications was a really big problem. Um, and even something as simple as contacting representatives to check up on how those things were progressing was difficult because people weren't in their offices and their contact information wasn't necessarily updated. And they were getting a lot of people trying to get a lot of questions answered and they had less people working. The project's timeline overall was impacted by a delay of about eight months. Um, that doesn't seem like that much, but in addition to concerns about things like spat set timing, which is better in Barataria than other places, and things like undertaking construction during the peak of hurricane season, which is a problem, this also meant that we weren't going to be able to meet the deliverable deadlines for our funders and our partners. The good news is we have excellent partners for this project, and they help make this reef a success despite all these delays. So the Loose Living Shoreline was funded by the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, Shell, the National Fish and Wildlife Federation, and the Wildlife Conservation Society's Climate Adaptation Fund. The original timeline budget deliverable to this project obviously did not take into account a global pandemic, and we worked really closely with all of our partners to make updates and address delays to help solve some of these unforeseen challenges. LDWF in particular was an invaluable resource, not just for helping with funding, but also because they know the regional oyster fishery very well. Um, they have even offered to assist in seeding the reef, which is really exciting. We also worked closely with our contractor, CEI, to address delays and find solutions. We relied really heavily on their experience to aid in speeding acquisition of permits and securing construction materials. We always work really closely with our contractors, but this was a we were on each other's speed dial sort of situation. The regional leaseholders providing the local knowledge of the area really helped us make sure that we had both a safe and smooth access to the site. One guy in particular, Captain Pete, who you can see on the boat there, even marked off the staging area for the construction barges for us, met the barges full of oyster shell in the access canal and led them like some sort of very strange parade to the site in his flatboat. It was great. Uh, I really can't thank these folks enough for their patience, their understanding and their support. Um, thanks to them, Barataria Bay has a new reef and we finished up construction just in time 
uh, we finished about a week before Hurricanes Marco and Laura moved through the Gulf. Thank you so much for your time. That's it for me. Um, again, I'm Krista Russell with the Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana, and please enjoy the next presentation. Hello again, everyone. As I mentioned earlier, my name is Haley Leha, and I'm the Habitat Restoration Manager with Galveston Bay Foundation. So one of my main roles is overseeing our oyster shell recycling program and making sure that all that shell we recycle gets returned to the bay as native oyster habitat. In case you're not familiar with Foundation, we are a local nonprofit based out of the Houston region in Texas. And our mission is both to preserve and enhance Galveston Bay, not only for the ecosystem benefits, but also for the benefits to the surrounding communities. And we do this through a variety of program areas. Uh, we have an incredible education team who works with students both in the classroom and out in the field. We, of course, uh, conduct quite a bit of restoration um, in marshes, along shorelines, and, of course, uh, with oyster reefs. We also have an amazing water quality and quantity team who work with volunteers to monitor water quality all around the bay. We've even conserved properties around Galveston Bay as well. I believe over 8,000 acres now has been conserved and managed by uh, Galveston Bay Foundation. And last but not least, we also work on advocacy. So to give you an idea of where we work, I always like to start with this map. So you can see there that yellow star, that is where our headquarters is located in Kima, so just southeast of the Houston Metroplex. And Galveston Bay itself is a bit of a misnomer. A lot of folks think that we work solely on Galveston Island, but in fact, we work throughout the entire bay system and all of its sub-bays, including Trinity, East, and West Bay. So what brings me here today is, of course, reef restoration. And sadly, habitat degradation is one of the key issues surrounding our estuary. Um, and one of those habitats is our native oyster reefs. Uh, specifically eastern oysters. And the reason for these losses stems not only from over-harvesting in the past, but also from extreme storm events like Hurricane Ike and Harvey. Um, with the harvest practices that have been conducted in Galveston Bay, the once very um, vertical relief reefs that we had are now more of a low-profile planar structure. And so with hurricanes like Ike that brought in so much sediment, those reefs, those live oysters were completely suffocated. So back in 2008 with Hurricane Ike, that incredible tidal surge dumped so much sediment on there, we lost over 60% of our oysters. Um, and even in East Bay, closer to 90%. And sadly, those same regions suffered again in Hurricane Harvey when that storm essentially turned Galveston Bay into a freshwater lake, and we're still suffering from some of those losses. Now, the Galveston Bay Foundation responded to these issues by starting an oyster shell recycling program back in 2011, and that's been ongoing to this day. Um, so unlike some of the bigger groups you'll hear from today, we are very small and grassroots. Um, you can see from this picture here, uh, we do have staff that collect the shell from our restaurant partners. And we are currently utilizing this landscape trailer pulled by a half-ton truck. So each of our restaurants receives this service for free at this time. And they receive either these bins or five-gallon buckets, depending on their output of shell. And after our staff collect the shell from the restaurants, they then take it to one of our upland storage sites, and we like to call our curing sites. And that shell is placed in about 18-inch piles um, until it's fully sun-cured. We turn it with tractors throughout that six-month curing period and then consolidate it into larger piles, uh, essentially to stockpile it for restoration projects. And so to this day, we have collected over 1,000 tons of shell, and about half of that has been returned to the bay primarily through volunteer efforts. Um, so we're very fortunate to have engaged with so many volunteers around the community. So what I'm really here to talk to you about today is how we're getting that shell back into the water. Um, now we do have a volunteer oyster gardening program that utilizes our recycled shell, but that is really more focused on community outreach and um, reef enhancement. All that spat grown by our gardeners is returned to one of our restoration sites. 
And if you want to hear more information on that, tune in to my colleague Michael Niebuhr's talk um, at the summit this week, and he will give you all those details. So what I'm really here to tell you about is our volunteer-based refresh-duration and some of our larger-scale efforts we're moving towards here in the near future. So the way we conduct our refresh-duration is primarily through shoreline protection, um, specifically living shorelines. Um, as you can see here, we are commonly building the oyster shell breakwaters with those mesh aquaculture bags that you'll see um, many other organizations using as well. And the reason we're doing this in Texas is because there's no real policy in place to protect sanctuary reefs and make them off limits to harvest. So we take advantage of the fact that um, along most private property shorelines, those reefs are restricted from commercial harvest um, due to human health and safety issues dictated by the state. So that's why this is a very effective way to create both reef habitat and protect the shoreline. And so to give you an idea of how this works, um, this is just some cross-section views of our oyster shell breakwater design. We adapted this from Tampa Bay Watch, so you may have heard it called an oyster bar. Um, but essentially we make those oyster shell bags with the mesh aquaculture netting and uh, place those in that pyramid formation to create that wave break. And of course create oyster habitat as well. And all of this is done through volunteer effort, which makes the projects that much more meaningful, at least in my eyes. Um, and man, these volunteers love this heavy duty work. I can't believe it some days. They are very, very dedicated. Uh, so these folks help us bag the shell, which weighs anywhere from 30 to 40 pounds per bag. And then they float it out in those blue tubs to wherever we're building that day and place the bags one by one to make that pyramid. And typically, depending on the size of the volunteer group, we can build anywhere from 25 to 100 feet of that oyster shell breakwater in one volunteer session. And of course, this is what we hope to see over time. Um, this is from one of our properties actually on Galveston Island. And, uh, you know, eventually the goal is for those oysters to completely encrust this structure, not only to solidify it as a breakwater, but also, of course, to build an oyster reef. And I've actually seen flounder, black drum, all sorts of species um, enjoying the benefits of this reef habitat. So far, we have constructed five of these projects throughout the bay system. Um, but like I said, this is pretty new to Galveston Bay. And we're one of the only ones doing this work um, in the northern part of the Texas coast. So that being said, with those five sites, we're starting to be able to kind of assess and work on some adaptive management moving forward with using our shell in these projects. Um, obviously, there are many benefits. Um, not only does it use our recycled shell, but of course the volunteer engagement is vital. We couldn't do this without our volunteers, and it's such a great way for them to get hands-on experience and exposure to the bay. We've even had a lot of corporate groups really enjoy doing these um, work days with us because they use it as a team building effort. And then sometimes they do match it with financial contribution, which is great for us too. Um, and of course, there are so many ecosystem benefits. I don't have to preach to you guys about that. Unfortunately, though, we are seeing some downsides to this approach. Um, there's a question about cost effectiveness uh, with the oyster shell, you know, while we're not effectively paying for that material, the collection of it is not cheap. Um, so, you know, there is kind of a cost benefit analysis you have to weigh in looking at using the shell and using volunteers over just paying a contractor to come dump rock. And of course, there are limitations with the volunteers. We do have to keep health and safety in mind. And so, these projects tend to take much longer. For instance, the one you're seeing most of these pictures from to, is ongoing to this day and it had been started in 2014, so six years, and a contractor could probably install that rock in a matter of a month. Um, so there's that as well. <clears throat> and then last but not least, we're running into issues with those mesh bags. That material is starting to break down. Uh, the picture you see on the right here is from one of our projects that's been in the water since 2013. Now, this one, I will say, is in more of a higher energy environment, which I would not recommend. 
Um, but it is surrounded by quite a bit of native reef. So we've seen great colonization there and it is still, you know, very much um, a thriving oyster reef. But as you can see, that bag material is breaking down and we do not want to be contributing to plastic pollution. It's a very bad PR. Um, you could have wildlife entanglement, all sorts of negatives. So we're looking currently to steer away from those mesh bags. <clears throat> Excuse me. In addition, we're also seeing the bottom two layers of that breakwater structure get submerged in the sediment. And we're not sure if that's because of the structure settling over time, um, if it's localized subsidence, and or maybe just the simple sediment accretion covering that shell up. But essentially that shell, so valuable, so expensive to collect, is basically being wasted. Um, I guess you shouldn't say wasted, but uh, sacrificed to the mud. So lots of things to consider with this design. So clearly research is needed. Um, we are, like I said, looking into alternative materials to contain that shell. Um, one of those being the gabion baskets that CRCL is using and many other groups around the country are starting to test out. Um, you know, our main goal now moving forward is determining is this the most sustainable use of our oyster shell? Can we place it loosely, which we've tried at one location, and I was hoping to have data to share with you guys today on that larger scale project, but sadly COVID um, delayed our research on that because we were involving uh, university students and they could no longer uh, conduct that monitoring for us. But that being said, we are looking into alternatives as we speak. So it's clearly time to reevaluate. Um, so we are really focusing on this research and monitoring component right now, uh, specifically with Texas A&M University at Galveston and University of Houston um, through a few amazing professors that are helping us to address some of these, these issues, uh, specifically the alternative shell containment ideas and looking into some sun carrying protocols and conducting additional research there. We also recently reinstated a regional oyster work group to help guide our restoration efforts, um, not only for the foundation, but for the region as a whole, and help us find ways to partner and work together more and cite future projects, come up with BMPs for the region. So we're really kind of in this reassessment evaluation phase to ensure that all of the shell we're collecting is put back into the bay in the most effective way possible. So, <laughs> with all that being said, um, this is even more important because we are trying to expand our shell recycling program into the inner loop of Houston where we have more densely um, uh, populated restaurants uh, that sell oysters and could potentially have a larger source of shell. So as we're hopefully expanding and, and gaining more shell in our program, we want to make sure we're using it in the right way. And uh, another little exciting announcement, we are hoping to launch this expansion next year with the inaugural Houston Oyster Festival, which has never been done. So we're very excited and very hopeful, um, as long as pandemic conditions allow, that this will be um, kicking off in 2021. And of course, big thank you to all of our partners and sponsors. And thanks to all of you for turning, tuning in virtually. Um, I'm sad we don't get to meet in person this time, but hopefully in two years, we'll see each other face to face again. Uh, please feel free to jot down my email, phone number. Um, I'd be happy to speak with you and look forward to hearing from you all in the Q&A session. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Katie Nichols and I'm the Marine Restoration Director with Orange County Coast Keeper. And today I'm gonna to talk about native oyster restoration using novel materials. I first wanna thank my co-authors, Dr. Christine Whitcraft from Cal State University Long Beach and Dr. Danielle Zacherl from Cal State University Fullerton. A brief outline of my talk, I'm gonna introduce you to our native Olympia oyster, talk about oyster restoration using coconut guar, uh, the successes and challenges with small scale oyster shell recycling, and further research. The Olympia oyster, Austria lurida, is the only native oyster to the US West Coast. It's found in bays and estuaries, and it cements one shell to hard surfaces and forms complex structured habitat. 
It was once prominent, but is now almost functionally extinct in Southern California with over 90% loss. And it's depleted due to a variety of human factors, including over harvesting, dredging, and pollution. But restoration efforts are underway along the coast. And fortunately in Southern California, we have enough remnant populations that we're not limited by the amount of larvae in the water column. If we build the right habitat, we think the Olympia oysters will come back. My colleagues and I have been restoring the Olympia oyster for several years now. And my colleague um, is an expert in Olympia oyster biology, Dr. Zacherl from Cal State Fullerton. And we've looked at using different configurations of shell, whether loose or bagged, and what tidal height and what thickness to optimize the settlement of the Olympia oyster. And we've worked at two main sites in Southern California, Newport Beach at the south end of Orange County, and Long Beach a little bit further north, and specifically in Alamitos Bay. And today I'm going to talk about the methods for oyster restoration. So in Upper Newport Bay, we are restoring the native oyster with and without native eelgrass in a living shorelines configuration to look at how these species interact and may provide co-benefits. But today I'm going to focus on the oyster shell, but I do want to give a shout out to that species eelgrass that we love as well. So for this, we used clean Pacific oyster shell, about 40,000 pounds that we initially purchased from an aqua farm in Carlsbad. And we put this shell out in hand-sewn coconut coir bags. You can see a picture of that coir in the right-hand side photo towards the bottom. I'm gonna go into depth a little bit about that material. Um, this project involved a ton of volunteers and was about 200 um, meter, square meters. And then at the end, I'll talk a little bit about Alamitos Bay and our efforts there, a little bit smaller with about 3,000 pounds of shell and about 80 volunteers. So the coconut coir, so you get a sense of what it looks like. It's used a lot in erosion control and not so much in oyster restoration. It's sort of a new material for this use. Um, that person on the left side is actually quite tall. It comes in rolls about six feet. Um, and we cut it using hedge trimmers and then hand sewed it using volunteers. Our initial goal was about a thousand bags and we made it to about 500 because this is a very time and labor intensive effort. I uh, highly recommend providing incentives to your interns and volunteers. So that uh, side right photo is a photo of our sip and see, a sip and sew um, that we held at a brewery. So maybe quality of the sewing went down a little bit, but our volunteers were a little bit happier. This is a picture of the coir up close and what a finished uh, bag looks like. So they were about a half meter by a meter long and they weighed about 20 to 30 pounds. For transport, we didn't really use any large um, structures or equipment. Most of this was transported via volunteers, personal vehicles, boats, and by hand out onto the mud flat. So this is what the restoration looked like in action. We had some mussel shell from the aqua farm that we put down as a first layer with just one layer of coir because we expected some subsidence initially and then placed those hand-sewn bags on top. On the right hand side is what a finished product looked like at one site, so about a 20 meter long bed with drainage channels built into it. Very important lesson we learned early on. Uh, and a shout out to over 250 volunteers that helped us out at three and four in the morning placing this shell on the mud flat. After about a year, we had native oyster densities that were over 14 times higher on our restored site than initial densities and over six times higher than nearby reference sites. After two years, we have consolidated native oyster beds living at two of our sites, and we just finished our three-year sampling effort, so we'll be able to see how these beds have changed over time. This is a graphic of the two-year post-restoration data um, compiled by my colleague, Dr. Zacherl, um, who's leading up some of the quantitative uh, sampling efforts. And on the x-axis, we have site, and then on the y-axis, we have oyster density. And you can see that regardless of whether or not eelgrass beds were present, native oyster densities went way up when we had a restoration um, at the treatment site versus a control. 
One of the challenges of our project is that we're in a highly utilized recreational bay. It's used by paddle boarders and kayakers, as well as recreational fishermen. Uh, we are in an estate marine conservation area where collecting from shore is not allowed, but uh, fishing with hook and line from shore is allowed. So what, we, what ended up happening is fishermen were inadvertently hooking some of the shell bags with their hook and bringing those up onto the beach. So in this photo on the left, you can see that happening. One of the bags pulled up on the beach and ripped open, unfortunately. So a strategy to kind of um, prevent this, what we did was provide outreach to people at the beach, educate them about the different habitats and how we were restoring them, provide flyers in a variety of languages, and we also worked with the city to install additional MPA signage to let people know that they were in a marine protected area. So although we had some disturbance, we wanted to maintain our restoration footprint. And so instead of um, adding more shell to the damaged beds, we decided to add on new beds adjacent to them because we didn't want to um, add shell onto those existing beds because we still had high oyster densities there, even where we had some disturbance. So this is a photo of how we did those new beds last year. And we used the coconut coir in a slightly different way. I did not want to sew bags by hand again, <laughs> although it's a great effort and people did somewhat enjoy it, a lot of work. So we ended up using a different method and sort of wrapping them like a burrito and hand tying them in the field. And this allowed for more continuous pieces that would be less likely to be pulled up by fishermen. We also built these at two different tidal heights so that we could see whether or not tidal height would influence oyster dynamics. This is a picture of that coconut coir of those newer beds six months later. We've been really interested in how that coir breaks down over time. And anecdotally, it's lasted quite a bit longer than I initially thought it would. We do have fairly low wave energy sites, but they do get boat wakes. And so we've been documenting the quar breakdown via photo plots, as well as annually monitoring for percent shell cover, bed height, rugosity, and the dimension. So see how these beds are changing in configuration over time. Bed integrity and quantifying it and how to maintain these uh, over time has been another challenge of ours. So the picture on the left is a bed once it was initially built. And the picture on the right is a couple of years later showing how it's spread and the coir has broken down. Now bed integrity and shell cover have varied across the sites, but we haven't seen a relationship between bed integrity and proximity of eelgrass. So again, the photo on the left is a bed once it was initially built. In the middle, you can see one of the sites, the shell has remained pretty consolidated and, and kept some of its integrity versus at other sites where it's more spread out. And beds at all of the sites except one have migrated up shore as well. So we've been looking to tease out what factors are causing differences in bed integrity among the different sites whether that's maybe some uh, human activity. So as I mentioned, all of our sites are in a state marine conservation area, but one of our sites is also in an ecological reserve that does not have any public access. So that could, could potentially be a factor. There may be some differences in wave energy or boat wakes among the sites, and then sediment and upshore um, marsh connectivity also might be playing into these uh, effects that we're seeing. Lastly, I wanted to men mention our Alamitos Bay site. Um, fortunately, we were able to get a bunch of volunteers out in March of this year, right before kind of COVID hit, and we built a 30 square meter bed. Similar to those mini beds in Newport, we used longer pieces of coir and a continuous, continuous bed. So we're hoping to get out this spring and see how those have held up over time. The challenges that we've had in shell recycling, particularly for Southern California, the big one is space. So finding storage space has been a real challenge. So our first shell was stored at a boat yard and we had to um, use some creative methods to containerize it and transport it using trash cans and a variety of containers to sort of move it around. 
Um, and then funding for that is also a challenge as a small nonprofit. We have done some shell recycling efforts with restaurants as well on a pretty smaller uh, scale. And fortunately, we recently developed a partnership with Irvine Ranch Water District, who is donating space for free to us in their corporate yard, which removes some of the issues that we'd have with pests and smell if you're clearing shell outside in sun, which is the ideal way to do it. Um, and so you're not having an area that has public access where you might have you know, problems with having pests or smell issues there. So further research, there's a ton of things we still want to look at, including expanding and extending our biological monitoring, uh, figuring out the best ways to adaptively maintain the restoration sites, expanding our work on sedimentation and shoreline erosion, using, utilizing LIDAR and GIS. Uh, we're also currently looking at how human use of the restoration sites might affect bed integrity. Um, lastly, I want to thank my collaborators and funding sources. I particularly want to acknowledge the Pacific Marine and Estuarine Partnership, or PMET. Definitely um, check them out. They're a pretty cool fish habitat partnership here on the West Coast. If you have any questions, feel free to check out our website at coastkeeper.org or shoot me an email. My email is katie at coastkeeper.org. Thank you so much for joining me today and listening to the presentation. See you later. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me OK? All right. Thanks for sticking around for our session on recycled oyster shell and reef restoration. We've got a lot of great questions, and I really enjoyed seeing all of the panelists' presentations. So sorry. Our PowerPoints did not come through, so folks, if you want more information from Krista, um, definitely jot down her email and reach out to her. So we've got some excellent questions. Find a few and then let each of our panelists address it. Um, so there's been a lot of recycling programs, tips, challenges, any regulations or policy hurdles. Is it actually cost effective? So I'd love to hear from each of you about that and how your organization has addressed shell recycling and getting your program going. Um, so let's start with Katie. I have you first on my screen. Sure. So of all the projects that were discussed, I think ours is the smallest in scale. We're talking like basically buckets from restaurants that were collected, um, not any kind of big trucks or large space. And so the main challenge for us was having a space that we could store it at. And we didn't secure that until recently where we got a space for free. Um, and I would say generally, uh, small scale shell recycling is challenging unless you have some good infrastructure or a, a large amount of funding to, in place to get those trucks and transport materials because um, it's difficult to kind of keep it going and to be cost effective on a small scale. Um, but the first thing I think is having the space to cure it. That's been that was one of our biggest challenges. Great, Charlotte and Danielle, you want to weigh in on your side of things? Sure, I can, um, I can answer that. So our, our largest challenge um, also has been obtaining curing space, um, especially in New York City. It's difficult to find um, space that's large enough that we can have volunteers at um, that's far enough away from water. Um, so right now we're looking at both both public and private options um, to expand our curing, curing space. Um, and we we have the capacity to take to have a six collection day, um, and we have the funding, but we don't necessarily. This is all if restaurants are reopening in New York. Um, but our our bottleneck right now is really finding space to put it all. All right, how about Krista? Yeah, so for us, the biggest challenge has been just sustainability of the program itself in the form of funding. Um, it is really expensive to move tons of rock around. <laughs> um, so that's, that's always been the biggest challenge. We have now 18 partner restaurants, but at one point we had as many as 26. Um, we move a lot of shell. Um, so it's regular constant pickups for our restaurants. They have the option of seven day a week and many of them take that. 
Um, our program is a little different. Our restaurants actually pay into the program. Um, they don't pay the whole cost. We subsidize that heavily for them. Um, but it keeps them engaged in a different kind of way. Um, and they can actually say that they're putting their money where their mouth is when they say things like they care about the sustainability of this fishery um, and what's happening to the coast. And that's worked out well for us so far. Um, curing space is another one. Um, we got funding for a new curing site recently, and it took us over a year to find somewhere. Um, but it's happening now, which is great. So. And Erin, what about you in North Carolina? Yeah, our program is still really new, and um, but I will say that, you know, we had state funding for a shell recycling program for about 15 years, and the state looked at the, the dollars and cents of it, and it didn't work out as far as being a cost-effective program, and that really is one of the reasons why they stopped the program, is they weren't getting enough shell in the recycling to make it worthwhile. Um, so there's the added benefits for us of doing the outreach and education that come from the shell recycling program that we're able to promote in a way that the state isn't always able to do. So we're, we still see the value in it. Um, we are, you know, our executive director has given us sort of the directive that we need to make it a cost-effective program ultimately, that it needs to sustain its stuff itself. Um, but we're in this phase right now where, you know, there's this, I think, magic number of how many bushels you collect um, and that sort of having that that volume that makes it cost effective and, and we're not I'm not gonna lie we're not at that point yet that it is cost effective to collect the shell but in North Carolina the state and nonprofits when we can't get enough through our recycling program we're able to buy from shucking houses and it costs about three dollars a bushel for us to buy shell um, to use in restoration projects and so that's sort of our target is trying to make the, our collection efforts equal three dollars a bushel or less, ideally. So that's what we're working towards, but I don't think we're quite there yet. And then we've got lots of space. Y'all are welcome to send your shell to us here in North Carolina. <laughs> we found working with our um, our local landfills and you know the county um, recycling centers, they've been able to set aside some designated area for us to put shell, and that's been a really effective partnership for us. Um, and then the state also maintains some stockpile locations that they've given us sort of a corner of their stockpile area to, to put shell. But, um, you know, we can always use more space, and there's always an op the logistics of getting it from those landfills to our restoration projects is another hurdle to overcome. But um, got lots of rural space here in North Carolina, so if you guys need places to store shell, <laughs> send it Good to way. know. Thanks, Erin. We'll ship some on a plane to you. <laughs> right, yeah, it'll be cost-effective that way. <laughs> yep. So it definitely sounds like storage and transport is a key issue, and I'll say we face the same challenges in Texas. Um, although space isn't quite as much of an issue, we've been fortunate to partner with the Port of Houston Authority, who's leased property to us for a very nominal fee, and we get to capture that value then for a lot of our funding. Um, and speaking of funding, too, we've been very fortunate to get federal uh, NOAA grants through our state CMP program. So that's been mainly supporting our efforts. Um, but yeah, I would say as far as challenges go, funding's the biggest for us. And then um, also just getting restaurants to cooperate and make sure that they're only putting that shell in the trash cans, not the actual trash. So that's a huge issue we still run into these days. And I see lots of heads nodding, so it seems like this is a common issue. Um, so I'll just hop right into another question here. I've seen a few of these come in about sun curing the shell. So the question was, how long do you sun cure the shell? What made you decide on that length of time? And are there any guidelines or protocols that your organization follows for sun curing? So if anybody wants to kick us off. I can. Um... So we follow um, the DEC's acceptable, the New York State's DEC's uh, Department of Conservation's acceptable origin um, for shell and shell stock, um, for the introduction of shell and shell stock in New York waters. Um, and that's kind of our guiding principles for curing in New York. Um, and we cure for a year. Um, just to be safe, but in that document, it actually, um, it says six months from the months of May through September, um, so during the hottest parts of the year. Um, but it just so happens that our shell usually ends up curing for over a year. 
before we um, have the permits to put it in. But that's a public document. You guys can um, look it up. It's very that good facts in it. Uh, I know our program follows similar guidance. Um, six months seems to be what everyone says is the minimum. Um, we're in Louisiana. We don't have to worry about it getting too cold for the curing to happen so much. Um, but even with that six months, just the cadence of how we complete projects and permitting, it takes, it's usually at least a year in between projects, if not a little bit more. Um, so that all of our shell sits for at least a year. Um, but that six month is the hard cutoff for us. And I would just weigh in, we're, we're similar at six months to a year for curing before the shell is used. Um, I will say that we've had some interest from our local fishermen. They would like to explore the, some of them say put the shell back in right away, that there's some sort of chemical cue that comes off of the shell that may attract more oysters. So it's an interesting area of research that I think needs some more investigation, whether or not there is any benefit to earlier you know, placement of the shell, if there's any kind of um, shell breakdown that would, by leaving it in the sun for too long, I don't know. So it's something that they're, they're asking us to explore and we'll probably look to do some sort of a small pilot research project with them to, to look at the curing timeline. And on the flip side of that, since we're using clean Pacific oyster shell across Austria gigas to recruit the native oyster, a different species, we have to be really careful about curing so that all that live tissue is gone. Mm -hmm. So it would be yeah, six, six months to at least a year, and usually it's longer than that. Yep, it sounds like the same as everybody else. Texas requires us to do at least six months, and again, it's usually more than that, a year to two years between you know that lag time you collect it and actually use it. Um, and kind of like what Aaron was saying, we're also starting to look into doing some research on this as well. Actually, I've got a grant due next week to hopefully fund some of this work next year. Um, but from what we've looked into thus far, there's really only one or two publications out there. The Bushick, uh, I think, 2004 publication, and that's where a lot of these timelines come from, at least that I'm aware of. I would love to hear from anybody else if you know of any other information. Oh, looks like uh, Maureen, thank you. You just put that publication in the questions here. All right, so uh, moving on to one other question, I'm seeing a few comments about, a lot of folks are asking if any of us are using rock or other type of culch material in addition to the shell, and if we do see a cost benefit to using the shell over that other material. Um, just any thoughts on that, folks? Uh, we did use mussel shell as a first layer just to deal with subsidence into the mud, so, but no, no rock. Yeah, we, we've only used shell because we have the shell recycling program. Ours, we're working in really high energy environments, so it has to be contained some way or it will end up several miles from where you put it. Um, but we are trying to get some more information. There are folks out there who say oyster shell attracts fat better than other substances. Uh, our systems aren't particularly spat limited, um, so the spat will set on a toilet seat. Um, but on you know, other places where there is a spat limitation, you may need something more like oyster shells, which kind of depends on the region from what I understand, but we're looking a little bit more closely into that because it is, it is expensive to recycle. Um, and I'll just jump in here too. Um, sorry for the background noise. Um, we've also used clamshell and uh, porcelain. Uh, so porcelain from crushed uh, uh, toilets. <laughs> Um, through the Department of Education in New York City. And we're actively exploring other materials for our restoration. We use um, quite a bit of marl and concrete in our restoration activities, usually as a sacrificial layer, and then can top dress it with the oyster shell. And as I also said earlier in my presentation, we're using um, a form of e eco-concrete, um, which uh, the oysters grow really well off of. Um, so it's not loose material, but um, it is a different substrate for sure. Yeah, in the state of Texas, um, Texas Parks and Wildlife typically does place either rock or limestone culture material and caps it with shell. 
Um, and kind of on that note, since we're running short on time, I'll pose a question to the panelists. What do you think the ideal height should be for a reef building off the bay bottom? I heard Aaron throw out 6 to 12 inches. I know our state reps have told me 18. But I'd just be curious to hear what you all think about that. I'll just follow up with that. So the 6 to 12 inches was just for that particular restoration project. All of our projects have, depending on the site considerations, have um, different dimensions associated with them. So I don't know if we can address a one single ideal height unless somebody else has knowledge on that. We've tried to get them to at least a foot when we can, a foot high. The thicker, I think for us it's been kind of the thicker the better. Yeah, our, I tried to answer some of the questions in the chat, too. I know we're, we might get cut off here, but there's a lot of good questions. So thanks, everybody, for participating and asking good questions. Um, I know for us, our, our reef projects are intertidal because they are designed as living shorelines. They're shoreline protection in addition to being oyster habitat. Um, so it's different. But subtitally, I know that the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries is usually trying to do at least a foot off the bottom. We have really, really soft bottoms and lots of sediment, though, so things can get covered quite easily. Yeah, I think that's where Texas is coming from, too. We get a lot of subsidence, so if you build a little bit higher, at least you can account for that settling as well. And yeah, Charlotte or Daniel, yeah. Yeah, um, we, we actually just installed a project this summer um, that we were uh, putting down loose fat on shell and loose blank shell, and to build the shell mounds, we put down around our range was 12 to 18 inches because that site was very, um, very soft. All right, everyone. Well, it looks like it is time. Thank you all so much. I'm honored to be a part of this panel today, and thanks, everybody, for joining us. Please feel free to reach out over email and hope to see you in two years. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye.